the other great philosopher uh, who uh, can be credited with having begun the philosophical revolution and uh, is as influential, if not more, as his Ustad in Mudram, which is Plato. We'll be looking at Aristotle's logic and theory of knowledge. We'll be looking at his theory of ethics very briefly. And finally, we'll come to his politics, which is of chief concern and interest to us. There's a lot of slides today, so I'm going to go through the slides somewhat quickly. Uh, but of course, these slides are also available on LMS and so on. So Aristotle was born in 384 BC, uh, passed away in 322 BC. He was, all, he was in Stagira in uh, Greece. He wrote about 31 works, and that's really, actually he wrote many more books, but uh, these are the ones that have come down to us. Many of his other works, etc., were really never sort of put together. Uh, in all, he wrote more than, a, they say, a, a more than a million words. And this is not, this is before word processing, so he wrote it with his hand, <coughs> which is great. And he formed the, another, great, another great institution, which is called the Lyceum. Just as Plato built the academy, Aristotle built the Lyceum. And you must have heard of Lahore Lyceum and so on, right? The word. So if uh, Plato is an, uh, built the academy, Aristotle rivaled it with his Lyceum. And of course, it was also very, very influential. I think I spoke about this earlier. He had a very, very close relationship with Plato, was deeply inspired by his work. He joined Plato's Academy at the tender age of 17, and he left it only once Plato died. He was there 20 years, and it's only once Plato was no more that he left it. But when he did, he turned Plato on his head, creating the greatest debate in the history of philosophy. In fact, the debate is so great that some people even say that that is still the only real debate in philosophy. I mean, the whole 2,500 years of the history of philosophy can set to be a debate between Plato and Aristotle. Itna bada is kind of And there's a famous saying, uh, we don't know whether it's true or not, but that Plato, when he discovered that Aristotle didn't subscribe to his, subscribe to his views, said something to the extent that Aristotle has kicked me as a cold kicks, cold kicks its mother. But Aristotle replied, Plato is dear to me, but dearer still is the truth. And that's a very famous uh, portrait, Plato pointing upwards towards the ideal forms, towards the sky, and Aristotle uh, pointing downwards to the earth, uh, because that also captures the two very different methodologies that these uh, great philosophers had. Another interesting fact is that Aristotle was the ustad e of Alexander the Great, and um, that's why I often joke that if you do a good ustad, you can conquer a small ustad, you can But after Alexander's death, uh, Aristotle feared for his safety and in fact left Athens. Um, and when he did, when he, he said, I see no reason to permit Athens to sin twice against philosophy. The first time, of course, was Socrates, and the second time would be Aristotle himself. So uh, philosophers at, at that time often you, you know, sort of got into trouble with the law, as you can see. Yeah. Aristotle can also be credited as being the first genuine scientist in history. Plato is much more of a philosopher. It would not really be correct to call him a scientist, but uh, uh, as far as natural science is done, but concerned. But Aristotle is one of the first great uh, scientists of history. And uh, as the Encyclopedia Britannica writes, every scientist in the world, in, the his, in history, is in his death. He wrote on botany, on biology, on logic, on music, on mathematics, <coughs> on astronomy, on medicine, on cosmology, physics, the history of philosophy, metaphysics, psychology, <coughs> ethics, theology, rhetoric, political history, government and political theory, rhetoric, and the arts. And he's regarded as arguably the most influential philosopher of all time. His political ideas were in two books. One is uh, uh, the book on Nicomachean and ethics, and the other is politics. So really, he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote. Uh, how did he do it? How could somebody write on so many different topics and actually have broken new ground on each topic that he wrote on? It's not, I mean, if people can write on 20 different topics but, uh, or subjects or whatnot, but the fact is that he discovered new things in every single thing that he wrote about. And they're so diverse, it's incredible. How did he do it? This guy must have been a, what is he, a born genius? Or is, he, is it in his genes? Or what was it about him? Well, the key was in his method of study. Once he devised a method of study, he was then able to apply that method to all the various subjects that existed. And 
was able to achieve remarkable results in each of them. Um, he really can be credited also with having created the first rules of logical reasoning and logical thought. Uh, and also, he is the great systematizer and classifier of knowledge. One of the great things he does is he takes whatever exists, all the knowledge that exists, and then he laboriously and meticulously classifies it and divides it and says, oh, this belongs here, and this belongs here, and this belongs here. He just organizes knowledge. So he's an incredible organizer. Uh, creator of inventory of terms. In fact, many of the terms, you'll be shocked to discover how many of the terms that we use, both in the natural sciences as well as in the social sciences, were invented, derived, or created by Aristotle himself. So these three great guys, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, really, they are the cornerstones of what we would consider to be Western political philosophy. Uh, what was his methodology? Well, his methodology was, first of all, he would start by doing what's called an endoxide index, a literature review. And if you know anything about writing for the social sciences, which you should, because, well, you're social science students, that's what we ask you to do in your essays as well, start with the literature review. Start by studying what other people have written. Then he would uh, boil down that literature into, into, into a dialectical debate. What are the two main big camps? that exist in all the literature in, in you know, what is, what is the main question that people are debating? Whether that, if you're looking at democracy, or you're looking at capitalism, or you, whatever question you're looking at, what are the big dividing lines? What's the big debate at that time? And then, of course, he developed a system of epistemology and a system of logic, and he would pass his, uh, you know, that, whatever, his understanding through that system and he would achieve remarkable results. So that was his overall method, is to study everybody that exists, classify it, understand the big debates, and then pass them through his method of logic and achieve remarkable results. So for this purpose, he created certain tools, logical tools, which he calls the organon. These are his books, categories on interpretation, prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics, and sophistical refutations. And these together, these books together, six of them, are what we call his tools, his logical tools, his tools through which he really manages to look at it. He also divides science into three interesting categories, and I find them particularly interesting because they say a lot about how the Greeks thought about knowledge and the sciences. First were the theoretical sciences, uh, and what we today call natural sciences would fall into the theoretical sciences. And then there were the practical sciences, and this was politics and uh, ethics and all of what we call humanities and social sciences. And then finally were the productive sciences, what we would call today skills and crafts and um, you know, what we study at polytechnical institutions. So the interesting thing that it says is today we consider the sciences to be practical. We say, and we consider the humanities and social sciences to be theoretical, you know, abstract and uh, airy fairy, tree loving, hugging, liberal sort of people who really are not connected with reality. In fact, the Greeks saw it the other way around. The reason why perhaps they saw it the other way around is because. Sciences themselves, natural sciences themselves, for Aristotle appeared to be theoretical because he didn't really see them as having too much practical value at that particular point in time. Whatever was practical was put into productive sciences anyway. But these were this is much more abstract understanding of uh, physics, chemistry, uh, and so on and so forth. So, what what did he write about that? Well, physics was in it was uh, uh, was in theoretical sciences. Well, the reason why I called it theoretical was because he believed. This was knowledge for its own sake. It wasn't knowledge for the sake of developing some skill or having some productive use of it or developing the economy or something. So physics was in that generation and corruption on the heavens, metaphysics on the soul, brief natural treaties, history of animals, parts of animals, movement of animals, meteorology, progression of animals, generation of animals. He really enjoyed studying animals as well as you can clearly see. What were the practical sciences, conduct and goodness? How to be, a, uh, you know, how, could, how to be an ethical person? Nicomachean ethics is named after his son. Uh, Eudemonian ethics and Magna Moralia, which is the great ethics, and of course the book that's most important to us, which is on politics, his book on politics. And finally, the productive uh, sciences included things that were the ability, the craft to create things that were beautiful or useful. So shipbuilding, agriculture, medicine, rhetoric, art, the arts of music, theater, dance, uh, poetics. I think rhetoric is there twice. Um, all of these are considered to be productive sciences. Rhetoric was very important to the Greeks 
because uh, a man that was eloquent and could make a good argument was considered to be, would have political power and would sway the people, etc. So Aristotle begins more or less in the same place where Plato leads off. If you recall from Plato, uh, there were two contending ideas that Plato was looking at. There was a Herac Heraclitian idea and the Parmenidian idea. Heraclitus thought, well, everything is in flux. And um, uh, this meant that things were always changing. And how could one have knowledge in an ever-changing world? And Parmenides, Parmenides thought that change was an illusion. Um, and he also got into trouble of explaining sense perception itself. How could we explain what we see if everything is illusion? And we see change, then how can we explain that? Well, Plato resolved this one way, he said, in, in his theory of ideas, his theory of forms, his epistemology. He said the ideal world was without change, but the material world was with change. The material world was based on certain limited number of forms which are ideal. And these ideals themselves were organized uh, in a relationship to each other. And the role of dialectics was to find out these ideals and the relationship uh, of these ideals to each other. So that's where uh, Plato, uh, sorry, where Aristotle begins. And Aristotle begins by demolishing Plato. His own ustad dekho kitna na shukra kisi ka bandha tha. But apne ustad he begins by demolishing Plato, and he does a remarkable job of it. First of all, he well, there's many many arguments that he he comes up with. Um, let me. Go. So let's look at these articles very quickly. What was his uh, what were his criticisms of the theory of forms? If we look at them uh, in a little more detail, they were firstly that Plato's ideas don't ex do not explain the existence of things. Sure, okay, you say, ke, Mr. Plato, that these ideas exist and the material reality exists. But what is it that results in the transformation of these ideas into material reality? I mean, you cannot explain that except by uh, you know, recourse to the divine, the demiurge, as, uh, as Plato said. How do you explain that in the material world, man is then born? The idea of man exists, it's a completely immaterial thing, it's a pure idea. How does it come about in reality then, that horses, <coughs> cats and dogs and so on exist? Uh, and Plato utterly fails with this. Even admitting that, say, the idea of whiteness exists, we cannot see how it produces white objects that remains completely open in Plato. Then he says, Plato does not explain the relation of ideas to things. Things we are told are copies of ideas and participate in them. But how are we to understand this participation? In using such phrases, Plato is giving no real account of the relationship, but is merely uttering, uttering poetic metaphors. There's no explanation of the relation of ideas to things. Not how things become, not ideas become things, what the relation between them, we know nothing about that. Motion is not explained by Plato. If ideas are immutable and uh, uh, the things that we see in matter are in motion, as Plato admits, how does motion happen? Is there an idea of motion? Either are the ideas in motion? Plato has no explanation for motion at all, uh, and this is a big, big contradiction in Plato. Um, then he says that there are a multitude of things. Uh, we know that in the world there are lots and lots of things. We have to explain the lots and lots of things with few things. And all Plato has done is multiplied the things by two and said everything that exists also has a form. This is not explaining anything. In fact, it's just doubling the number of things. In fact, you know, multiplying the number of things that require explanation. Um, he says, Plato merely assumes the existence of another multitude of things, the ideas. But the only effect of this is to double the number of things to be explained. How does it help us to duplicate everything? Plato is like a man who being unable to count with a small number of number, fancies that if he doubles the number, he will find it easier to count. So he's just doubled the number of things that have to be explained. He hasn't explained anything. Then he says, ideas are sensuous. Plato thought that a non-sensuous principle must be sought in order to explain the world of sense. But not being able to find any such principle, he merely took the objects of sense over again and called them non-sensuous. There is no difference between the horse and the idea of the horse except the useless and meaningless in itself or in general attached to each object of sense to make it appear something different. So the horse in general, what, is that? what does that even mean? It means nothing. The idea of the horse is the horse. The horse is the idea of the horse and so on. Ideas are nothing but hypo hypothesized things of sense no different from the anthropomorph anthropomorphic gods of popular religion. Just as gods are nothing but deified men, 
like Zeus and uh, uh, Apollo and Atlas and so on. There's deified men, he says. And so these ideas are nothing but externalized things of nature. Things are said to be copies of ideas, but in fact ideas <coughs> are only copies of things. So he's not moving us any for, further. And last, uh, one of his strongest arguments is called the third man argument, in which he says, whenever you see two ideas, like a white ball, there's the idea of whiteness and the idea of the ball, well, they combine in some way to create a white ball, right? Or a red ball, whatever it may be. Well, how, if these two ideas combine, then there must be a third idea that explains how the two combine and what proportion they combine, why they combine, and so on. So that, this is the third idea now that has to be generated in order to explain the, the, the bloody white ball, which was one idea. Now we have, uh, you know, a white, our concept of whiteness and a concept of the ball and how they match together. This is yet another idea that we have to explain. So there is a common element in all men, therefore there is an idea of man, but there is also an element common to the individual man and to the idea of man. There must therefore be a further idea, the third man, to explain this. And between this, further ideas in the individual man, there must be yet another idea to explain that they have in common and so on ad infinitum. So I'm a man, you're a man, right? But, uh, but you're also a man, so there has to be one idea that explains the connection between you and me and the difference between you and me. Yet another idea that explains the connection and the difference between you and him. Yet another idea that explains the connection between you and me and the difference between you and me. Oh my God, there are so many ideas to explain. It's just multiplying everything and creating complete confusion. Koi cheese Plato explain And finally, he concludes that essences cannot be outside of things. They have to be in those things. Ideas are the essences of things. And yet these essences are outside of things themselves. How is this possible? <coughs> the essence of the thing must be in it, he says. The idea as the universal can only exist in the particular. The universal is not something that exists by itself and independently of the individuals. There is no such thing as whiteness that exists outside of white objects. You, anytime you think of white, you're, look, you're thinking of an object that's white. You can never not think of an object which is white. Or you're thinking of white light, or you're thinking of a white plane, or something like that, right? You, you cannot but think of things in their particular formation. Plato was led into the absurdity of talking as if beside the individual horse we know there is something, somewhere another individual called the horse in general, or as if besides white objects there is a thing called whiteness. And this is in fact the supreme self-contradiction of whiteness. And it begins by saying, that the universal is real and the particular is unreal. Universal say Muslim, the general idea is real and the particular is unreal. Whereas in fact it's the opposite which is the case. It's the particular which is real, we see it, we can touch it, we can feel it, it's there in front of our senses, etc. And the universal is something that we derive from examin the examination of particular objects. So we look at a lot of horses and we say, you know, these particular animals have some properties in common, I'm going to call this a horse. That's what's going on, he says. It's not that there's a concept of horse some sitting somewhere in the sky, and then you remember it because you had some recollection of it in, the, in some past life, he says. No, you look at a lot of animals, and then you say, OK, these animals walk on four legs, and these animals walk on two legs. So first of all, let's divide these. Then you say, OK, these animals have furry skin, and these animals have uh, dry skin, so you divide them. Then you discover these animals are warm-blooded and these are cold -blooded. So you keep dividing and dividing and dividing, and that's how you create categories. And this is a social process, a process of observation and a process of um, division and classification that we are undertaking. It's not some abstract idea that's coming to us from up on high. Um, so, the, so basically, Plato is making the mistake of saying that existence is unreal, and what is actually real, what is actually real, he's saying, is unreal, and what is nothing but an abstraction of the real, he is saying, is real. So he's stood everything on its head. So what is uh, Mr. Aristotle going to do now? Well, he is going to bring things back to the way they should be. Yes. So all of these arguments actually make sense, but what was that about uh, motion? The third point. Motion. Kind of motion? Very simple. Okay, idea static. Dunya ke andar motion hai, change hai, har wakit tabdili hai, kaise? If there's an idea, is there an idea of change? This ki was dunya ke andar tabdili hai. How can you explain change? If the ideas are static, why do things change? There's no explanation, right? So either, ya to change is wajah se ho raha hai ke, wo ideas bhi change ho rahe hai. To phir ye bhi change ho raha hai, to that makes sense, 
because they, you know, sort of they're sort of uh, mirroring each other. But if the ideas are static, then what? That, why are these things changing down here? What's going on? There's no explanation according to me. According to me, sir. Yes. <coughs> Because the ideal world is all good, uh, the evil in a real world is uh, because of change, and, change uh, and this change comes uh, because the real world doesn't matter, and the uh, ideal world doesn't. Sure, but there's no explanation then, right? I mean, that's not an explanation. To just say it's evil doesn't give us an explanation of how does it occur. If everything, one second, if everything in this world is related to an idea, where is the idea of change? Is there an idea of change? And if there's an idea of change, then uh, you know, if there is no idea of change, then how does change come about? And if there is an idea of change, or if ideas themselves are changing, then that's uh, completely left open. So all the particular things are basically derivations of things in the ideal world. And because the ideal world is static, it is impossible that its derivations will be Ex moving. Exactly right. Exactly. How is it that if in the ideal world everything is static, <coughs> in the real world everything is changing? How does that happen? It's, you can create some theory out of it, but Plato has no theory, no explanation. Right? Yes. So then again, Plato also says that the things that exist in this world are some forms of the idea that exist in the truth. So can't you say that the things that exist in this world are in motion because they're trying to achieve the static self of complete definitely? You can say that, certainly, but you still have not explained how is it that motion is possible if everything is based on a static idea. Uh, as you said during the Plato lectures, that things that exist in the world aren't completely exact copies of what exists. Why? So because everything is not the same here. Why? Plato can't explain it, you see. Yeah. Why is it not the same, buddy? You'll say, oh, there's another idea which says, okay, you know how an ideal thing, when it comes into this thing, is slightly different from that thing. multitude of all ideas. So if you go one step further, and you ask, start asking more why questions, Plato's stuck. Yes, sir, but he said, uh, Plato said that uh, that idea is not very specific. That is sort yeah, of it's a general, idea. general form. Yeah. Right? Then how can uh, Aristotle expect him to explain K, how is the specific... So that's the question idea? that Plato has to answer, not Aristotle. If there's a general idea, but there's a specific form for every woman, how does the general transform into the specific? How does the universal become a particular? Right? So like, let's say there are women that are African-American, uh, let's uh, without any intention of being racist here, say that they are uh, black in the, in the color of their skin, and there are other that are yellow. There's another idea that's participating in them. So how does that relationship even occur? It's stuck. And then how do they live or die? How does change occur? If the, ideas are, if the idea for women is static, why do actual women live and die? Right? He does. Plato has no explanation, and you cannot derive an explanation from it. Is, is what Aristotle is asking. And so he's got these like six, seven uh, criticisms of Plato, which are quite interesting. Yes. Was all of this during Plato's lifetime? Yeah, he started uh, developing this uh, during Plato's lifetime, and then of course he uh, elaborated it after Plato's death as well. Sir, can we call him an, an empiricist? And we're going to come to that just a bit. Can come to that just a bit, but certainly empiricism is derived from many of the ideas of Aristotle. It's quite fair to say. It's not that you can call Aristotle purely an empiricist, uh, because there are many ideas in Aristotle that are, you will see are not in line with empiricism as we understand empiricism of the Humean and Lock, uh, Lockean and the uh, Bishop Barclay and all of those guys. So, but there are but certainly many of their ideas are influenced in turn by Aristotle. And induction in particular is deeply influenced by Aristotle. More questions? So, Oh my god! Itna maza aya tha mein week, sir. Aapne ye kya kiya hai? Pehle aapne ek mandir ko itna khada kiya hai. Phir isi ko patakke maar diya. Ye to bade zyadhi ki hai. Aapne itna bada philosopher. Well, that's happened. That happens in philosophy. And it happened within, started happening within Plato's lifetime. So, uh, properties that are that are eternal, the forms have eternal properties, eternal, they're unchanging, they're transcendent, but this is incompatible with the material objects that they create, which are changing temporal, they're material, they, they have no explanation. The resemblance between objects and form must also be explained in terms of another form. What form does, does an object and the form both copy to account for the similarity or dissimilarity? 
This leads to an infinite regress, negating the notion that forms are few. Plato, can you both emphasize that, that he's going to explain a lot of things with a few forms, right? All of man is sort of, you know, all of humanity he can put under the category of human in the abstract. But now he has to, if there are six, million, six billion sorry, human beings, then he has to have, well, six billion factorial to explain all the differences between them. If you know your math, where's the mathematician? Am I right? Is it six million factorial? To explain all the dissimilarities and similarities between them, bloody hell. It would probably be two into six million factorial, which is insane. You know, so you can't do this. <coughs> negates the purpose that Plato had set out to accomplish, which was to explain a lot of things with a few factors. So, now what he's going to do is he's going to put Plato on his head. Well, not physically, this is just a joke. Uh, but he says, in fact, Plato is wrong to say that senses give us in accurate information. Senses, in fact, give us accurate information about reality. Even when we see the bent ore, yeah, chappu jab aap pani mein dalte hain, to aapko nazar aata hai ke chappu teda ho gaya hai. To asal mein to chappu teda nahi hai. So the information, jab aap pani se nikalte hain, aap dekhte hain, wohi to sita pani mein dalte hain, wohi teda ho gaya. To, but is that information wrong? Aristotle says no. It's not wrong information. It's still telling you something about reality, which is accurate. What is it telling you about reality, which is accurate? Light. Exactly. That light refracts. When it goes through a thicker or a more dense medium, it refracts. That's what it's telling you. It bends, right? It turns. So fascinating, right? So it's give, actually, the bent ore is giving you accurate information. That light is passing through two different mediums, and hence, what you're seeing in the air medium is going like this, and what you're seeing in the water medium is going like that. So it's not incorrect information. It's correct information. But you, know, you need to know how to interpret it correctly, how to understand it correctly. So, and so then he says, so first of all he says, the senses are not giving you inaccurate information. They're giving you accurate information. You just need to know how to understand it, baby. Okay? The idea of horse, Says Aristotle, you complicated things so much. Dude, it's very simple, he said in his American accent. He said, like the idea of a horse was like simply a concept that like we humans had formed like after seeing a certain number of like horses. He didn't say it like that. But what? We saw a number of animals, we saw a number of horses, we said, you know, this animal looks, this guy, this animal looks the same as this animal, which looks the same as this animal. You know what I'm gonna call it? I'm gonna call it a horse. Really that simple. Uh, by form, the form of a horse, Aristotle meant that which is common to all horses. You have to have certain properties that are common to be called a horse, or to be called a man, or a woman, or a cat, or a dog. Forms were in the things because they were the particular characteristics of those things. So you should not be looking for the essence in some sky in the high, sky in the pie, pie in the sky, sorry. You should be looking for the forms in the particular objects themselves. The properties that are common is what the forms are. The real objects and the form of the objects are just as inseparable as body and soul, he says. So, as Sartre says, perception starts with the eye. Senses are the basis of knowledge. Things that are in the human soul pure are purely reflections of natural objects. By the soul over here, he doesn't mean the religious concept of the soul. He means because in ancient Greek philosophy, they often use the terms, and in all philosophy, they often use the term soul to also mean. <coughs> okay, so the things that are in the mind, you, must, you should read the sentence like the things that are in the mind, are purely reflections of the natural objects. I look at something, I look at that bag, and in my mind, I form an image, a picture of that bag. Nature is the real world, he says. The world of matter is the real world, not the world of ideas, as Plato said. Nothing exists in consciousness that has not first been experienced by the senses. Wow. <coughs> Can you think, <coughs> this is a fascinating thought experiment. Can you think of an alien which is so weird that it is utterly unrelatable to anything you've seen or heard or, uh, as a human being? Can you think of something that you have never seen? In, not in the, of course you can think of something you haven't seen. I, I can think of a three-legged uh, or three-winged uh, fairy. I've never seen one, right? 
My point is, those are amalgams of various things we have seen. Like a dolphin is an amalgam of a woman and a, sorry, not a dolphin, <laughs> a, mermaid. a mermaid. I keep getting this confused. Even with my kids, you know, with Zara and Zoe, I say, oh, you want a dolphin? They're like, yeah, no, I want a mermaid. <laughs> Is, is, a, is a combination of a, uh, of a woman and a fish, right? Or, so we can make various combinations and permutations of, even when we do aliens, like you know those big bad scary monsters in that film with, um, uh, the, you, know, Pro, you know, the alien series, right? Prometheus and all this stuff, right? Where the alien comes and then he fights the, the and the woman finally wins, et cetera, et cetera, and all that stuff. So even the aliens are just different combinations of animals we've seen in our own imagination. We just put them together differently. We say, "Chesh ka naak kya kar denge, iski aankhe kya kar denge, iska skull yung kar denge, bhagera bhagera, iski claws yung kar lenge." It's our imagination is based on what we've experienced. What we experience. It's it's like asking. And this is a, this is a sad but important thing. Could a blind person understand what color is? Imagine what color is. It's difficult, born blind, to imagine color. It's <coughs> difficult if you've never seen it. A person who's born deaf, could they imagine what music is? It would be difficult, right? So it's from the senses that our minds develop very senses. Yes? You said that dark doesn't explain, for instance, technological uh, innovation. Why? Because, like, how did the first wheel form that? Why is that hard to explain? Yeah. Because people couldn't imagine it back then. then. It doesn't mean that, it, it means that what they imagine are things that they have seen uh, in the, uh, the, the, what he means, what Aristotle means is that the raw material of imagination is provided from our senses. That's what he means. We put that raw material together in different ways to come up with new ideas and new things and inventions and so on. We can't invent something uh, of which, which does not come out of some experience of ours. Okay, khubsurat say in necessity is the mother of invention. We invented things because we were doing things. What were we doing when we invented the wheel? We were trying to transport things, right? How were we transporting things in the ancient world? Heavy things like logs and so on. Well, we laid the logs down and we rolled them. That's how. When we cut down the trees, we laid them down and we rolled them. And then we started rolling on th things on top of the rolling logs. And then we said, well, you know, this is pretty cool. What if, well, let me cut the log out. So, you know, you cut the logs to roll things. Like, for example, the ancient Egyptians, how did they get those massive stones moving? Yeah, those massive stones with which they built the pyramids. How did they move them? They moved them on logs. Yeah, they used to take the stone, they used to take a lever, pull it up, roll a log under it, <coughs> push from, from Piche, and they would get it on top of the logs, and then they would roll the logs. But two slaves would come and put another log, and then another log, and then another log. So that is really the origin. And so then they developed that further. They said, all right, you know, how can we get this log to be rolling without, uh, not as a full log, but you know, put something on top of it. You know, so then they came up with, this, with, with a round wheel. We just a spoke, spoke in it, then they came up with wheels with spokes, etc., etc., and so on. That's how they developed it. Because the rural thing, the uski vajay se pe aise aise nahi, the cheese developed. Okay, the mind has the innate faculty of organizing all sensory impressions into categories and classes. So when you look at things, you want to organize them. You want to understand them. To understand them, you have to organize them. So you start to say, you know, if I look at so many different things. Um, everything I look at is different. There are no, no two exactly similar <coughs> objects in the world. So to help me, to, um, to 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 help me to utilize that information, uh, mankind started to create general ideas like horses. So I wouldn't have to say if I had named every single horse, uh, given every single horse a name, and if I had to tell you find me more horses, I'd be very I'd be very very hard done. I'd say. Find me somebody like, let's say I named one of my horses Tony. Find me some, an animal like Tony. He said, but there is no animal like Tony. No, it can be an animal like Tony or it can be an animal like uh, uh, Mona, uh, which is the second horse, and the third horse, and the fifth horse, and the sixth horse. I'd have to tell you all the name of the horses and say, find me something that looks like all of them. Finally, you'd say, you mean find me a horse. <laughs> I'm like, yes, find me a horse. Thank you. We'll call these, these animals, we'll call them horses. 
it made things easier to communicate, to understand, and so on. So that's the idea. So the mind, when it organizes information, it gets. This is a process that we undertake. It's a social process. It's a process that uh, is undertaken not by um, something that exists in the abstract, but by your own intellect, says Aristotle. When you see things, when you hear things, when you touch things, when you taste things, when you feel things, when you hear things, you get all the sensory data, and then you start to put it together in some way. So what is substance and form? Well, Aristotle says substance you can think of as something, whatever, whatever everything is created out of is, let's say, substance. It changes, it's Heraclite. And the essence are, is what we turn that substance into. Like we have a, a, we have clay, and then we can mold that clay into a pot. The clay is a substance. <coughs> The pot is the form that the clay, clay uh, becomes. So in this way, we can see that there is, there is some value in understanding form and substance, or the difference. You can create a pot out of a different substance. You can create a bronze pot, or an iron pot, or a clay pot, right? So the substance here is varying, but the form is the same, essentially. Okay? So that's the difference. That's the real difference, he says, between substance and form. And how does substance take form? How does it become something? What's the process through which <coughs> things become other things? Well, first you have the material cause. The material cause, he says, is the raw material, right? Nature, earth, clay, whatever. Then you have the formal cause. The formal cause is the form that, that, that you want it to turn into. So it's the plan, as you can see. It's the plan. Then you have the efficient cause, which is whoever <coughs> puts this together into this, puts the form into the, into the clay, is the efficient cause, i.e. the person doing the work, whether it's a person or nature or God or whatever, but this is the efficient cause which is making things move. It's, it's the, oh, you can, you can also say it's the external cause, because form and substance is, aren't going to put themselves, themse put, put, come together themselves. Somebody is putting them together. Some force is putting them together. And that's basically the efficient cause. And then there's the final word, which is what it wants to become. What is it that it is going towards? What is its teleology? What is teleology? Teleology is a very particular way of understanding the world. It is that everything is changing, but everything is changing towards some goal which is going to be unchanging. Some unchanging goal. Everything, in other words, to put it very simply, is trying to move towards its perfect form. So, for example, you plant a tree, you, sorry, you plant a seed, and slowly the seed becomes a full-grown tree, right? It's that full-grown tree which is the essence of the seed, which defines the seed. And this is a superb way for Aristotle to, in fact, distinguish between different seeds. So you may have one seed, or not just seeds, to, but to classify things. So he wants to classify things not just by looking at the state they are in presently, but the state they want to achieve, or the state that they are going to achieve. And that, he says, it helps me classify not only seeds, but people, and states, and politics, and ethics, and so many other things. What's the end goal here? What's the, what's the final goal? The world is coming to an end, but what are your goals? That's what is important. He says the goals define the teleology defines what I think. Yes. How do we define the perfect form and the perfect goal, or the end goal? I mean, how yeah, the end goal, the, the end of that thing is the perfect form, right? So that's the form it's trying to achieve. <coughs> it's most complex and developed form. That's what Aristotle would say. And that's the final cause. The final cause, the essence, is the essence of the object. Hence, essence is not in the ideal world, but within the thing itself. It's like a seed that becomes something big. And that's what describes, that helps us categorize and describe what that thing is. Um, now, in the world today, and in scientific discourse today, we no longer think in terms of teleology. In fact, we consider teleological arguments themselves to be very, very unscientific. Uh, because you can get a teleology where you say food and water are necessary conditions of life. But were food and water created for us? Were they created for life? That ascribes a teleological motive to food and water. But that teleological motive, according to modern science, does not really exist. Were mice made so that cats could live? Were cats made so that dogs could eat them? Or dogs not eat cats, but you get the point, right? They weren't made for this person, purpose. 
But understanding the purpose of something, says Aristotle, helps us categorize it. So that's teleology. What's the purpose of life? What's the teleology of life? What's the purpose of society? What's the teleology of society? What's the purpose of history? So religion is also a teleology in that sense, right? The purpose of life according to religious teleology is to be a good person and to go to heaven. Am I right? Uh, is the day of, uh, according to, let's say, the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition, is to, uh, you know, there are many, many religions in the world, so, but according to our religion, uh, or I assume our religion, there may be people of different religions in this classroom, um, but that's the end goal of existence, is akhirat is the end goal of existence. That's what describes life. So that's a particular religious teleology, but there can be other teleologies as well. Everything has a, to put it very briefly, Everything has a purpose. The purpose defines that. That's teleology. Now, the very opposite of teleology is teleology is the end goal, the purpose, right? The final stage. The very opposite of that is the first cause. What is the first cause? Well, Aristotle says, if in the end of something is the is is you know is is the teleology. If you move backwards and backwards and backwards, you have to keep going backwards. And he gives a metaphor which is very physical. So say for example, whatever I move, I have to be more stationary than whatever it is that I move. Very common physical thing, right? If I push something, I have to be more stationary than what I am pushing in order for that object to move and for me to stand still. Am I right? So for example, if I'm on wheels and I try to push the car, what will happen is that I will go backwards. If I'm on skates, roller skates, I'll start going backwards unless the skates are sideways or something, right? I'll go backwards. So that means that the car is more stationary than I am. It has more inertia than I am. I move. When, when a force is applied between us to separate us, the car doesn't move, I move. It's more stationary than I am. But if I have my feet firmly planted on the thing and I push hard and the handbrake isn't on and somebody isn't pressing the brake and saying, push harder, then the car will probably move forward, which I did with a lot of my friends. Yes. Sir, we're talking about like causal argument, right? So the problem that's very famous about uh, causal argument is you go to infinity, you made a rule that everything must have a cause, but then you stop at uncaused uh, cause. Like, why do you stop there? Yeah, so I'm coming to that. I'm coming exactly to that. So if every cause, now I'm pushing the car, the car is moving, that's the effect. I'm the cause, that's the effect. If I were less stationary than the car, right, if I had, uh, if I, uh, had less inertia than the car, then I would move. I'd become the cause, and the car would become the effect. So for the, co the cause has to have greater inertia than the effect. Now, if you keep going back in terms of cause and effect, whoever is doing the f you keep going back, you're going back in terms of inertia. You're going back in terms of movement, in terms of change. So you finally end up with a cause which is unmoved, which is unmoved and cannot be moved. You, go, you take an infinite regress. You go back to, think of it in terms of momentum and motion, right? Everything has momentum in the world, right? Um, uh, so if we keep going back in, in, everything with greater momentum can push something with less momentum. Am I right? <coughs> can move something with less momentum. Momentum is what force into speed or whatever, right? So, no, sorry, uh, mass into speed, right? So. Am I right? Yeah. Mass into speed, right? Mass into velocity. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> break, people. I'm trying to make it simple for you. OK, mass into velocity, mass, which is the same as saying mass into speed. But anyway, so something with greater momentum can move something with less momentum. So for example, when I take a billiard ball and I go and I break the rack, why does that happen? It happens because although the two balls have the same mass, the momentum of the ball that I'm hitting is much greater because it's moving fast, correct? Or if I could, I could take a very big, heavy ball, platinum, made of platinum or something, and just tip it, and you can be assured that it would move all the balls because it would have such great mass in it that it would move it. And if I take a ping pong ball and I hit, uh, you know, I hit a rack of billiard balls, what's going to happen? Those billiard balls will not move. The ping pong ball will go ding, 
it will fly off, right? Because it does not have the necessary momentum to move those other poles. So if you go back in terms of cause and effect, every cause must have greater momentum than the, uh, than the effect. So you keep going backwards, keep going backwards, keep going backwards, because you go to greater and greater inertia, and you end up, as if, if you do an infinite regress in this way, you end up with the unmoved mover, the, the cause which no other cause can move. It has such enormous mass and momentum, uh, or, or, or rather it has such enormous inertia that it cannot be moved by any other object, but it can move all other objects. So think of the universe in terms of all the spinning planets and the spinning stars and the spinning galaxies. And think of what's, you know, think of all of that as momentum. Right? Aristotle wasn't thinking in this way because he didn't, it couldn't have known how large and amazing the galaxy is because, of course, the uh, uh, telescope and other things were invented much, much later in history. But uh, for our sakes, imagine, you know, everything is a whirling ball going forwards and backwards. And, you know, you set things into motion, into momentum, like what you tick, 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 karke cheez chalti hai, ya apne kabhi ko bhambiri ko mayi hogi ishna karke, ya ko yo-yo ki hoga, gara, right? You're putting things into motion. And you're more powerful than the things that you put into motion. So you go backwards, what you come to, you come to the prime mover, to the uncaused cause, the cause which causes all the other causes are down to infinity, which gets the whole world moving. And this, uh, Aristotle also calls God. This is God, because it's the unmoved prime mover, the first cause. But this is not, this is a very different concept <coughs> God from, from religion, because this is a, this is a sort of God which is, uh, it's, it's a sort of a, uh, how should I put it? It's sort of a. It's not a. It's not a thinking anthropomorphic sort of, uh, you know, God which is rewarding you for good behavior and bad behavior. It's more of a force, a natural force than a force of nature that puts everything into motion, rather than uh, a religious concept conception of God which is very anthropomorphic. What do I mean by anthropomorphic? Very much human in one sense. Uh, it's not, God is not human, but in one sense, in the sense of God thinks and acts and speaks and so on, right? So this is not that sort of conception at all. So uh, Aristotle's unmoved mover is eternal, intelligent, and non-material. This is pure form thinking about itself. This is actuality without potentiality. This is perfection. This is God. But not a God that can, intervenes in the affairs of nature. Uh, which always follows a natural course. This is a God unmoved by both earthly and cosmic events. It's not a God that says, um, that says, I must intervene in Jangi Badar and save my people, obviously. This is like a force of nature more than an intervening God. Okay? So, and you can, you can see the how natural scientists who tend towards atheism like this kind of conception uh, of God rather than a religious conception of God. This is like a force of nature rather than uh, an intervening God. Okay. Now, to Aristotle's... Should we take a five-minute break? Yes. yes. Okay, let's take a five-minute break. I'll start with one exactly, okay? Should I stop recording? <laughs> Ask him. Ask me other people. Kya I love Ask me other people. I love the way how everybody said yes. Say, should I stop recording and then start? Yeah, yeah, don't record the 